Hello and welcome to Global Pulpit, where the world is our parish. I'm Camille Magdaly from Teach All Nations, and we want to give you God's unchanging word for changing time. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Friends, I've been teaching the Word of God for over 40 years. I studied in Jerusalem about the historical geography of the Holy Land. I also ran a Bible college in Melbourne, Australia for years. And those two pivotal events in my life have put me on a track to do what I do today, giving people God's Word anywhere in the world. For friends, when we hear God's Word, faith rises up. When we obey God's word, it puts us on a rock, the rock, the rock Christ Jesus. And when you have your foundations in Jesus, you're not only unmovable, but you will withstand all of life's storms, bringing you safely to your desired haven. Think of this as a mini Bible college without the exams and homework assignments, but the opportunity to learn and grow strong in faith, because your faith is a lifeline to the wonderful things of God. I've begun a mini-series on the foundations of the faith. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, there are six doctrines of the faith. Repentance, faith, baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection from the dead, and eternal judgment. I've given two global pulpits just for repentance alone. I'm going to aim to do faith in one session, and that's today. Remember Hebrews 6.1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Faith towards God is what we will focus on in this session. What is faith? Well, it's so simple a child can understand it. But in our context, faith simply means strong belief in God and in His Word. I'll say it again. Faith is strong, compelling, all-consuming belief in God and His Word. And faith comes from his word, hearing his word, Romans 10, 17. First of all, let me give you the steps to biblical faith. I have given these steps in another sermon, but they bear repeating because they are simple, they're easy to remember, and they are so, shall we say, comprehensive. It covers just about every base. So first of all, faith means to believe. Remember what Jesus said in Mark 1.15, his first recorded words in the glorious gospel of Mark, that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's it. Repent and believe. Foundational doctrines. And believe what? The gospel. And why should we believe the gospel? Because the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. It really is. Just because you can't see it in the natural doesn't mean it isn't there. That's why we need the new birth, because when we have the new birth, we will see the things that the world does not see. We will hear the things that the world does not hear. We will experience the things that the world is totally exempted from in its current state. Let's believe and enter into that wonderful, wonderful door. Faith also means to receive. John chapter 1, verse 12, For as many as received him, that's Christ, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. There is that faith word again, believe. Now just remember, the devil and the demons also believe. They don't doubt the existence of God. They don't doubt that the Bible is God's word. They don't have a doubt of it. They know it is. But they are rebelling against these truths. And of course, they will ultimately fail. And in many ways, they've already landed the mortal blow. But 
it takes some time before they finally go out of commission. So faith means to believe. It means to open up your heart and receive the King of Glory. Number three, faith means to confess. What is in our heart will come out of our mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth shall speak. So we confess. And we know that when we confess Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. We'll learn more about this if time permits a little later. But what is in your heart is going to come out of the mouth. That's why we need a heart overhaul, a new heart altogether, replacing the heart of sin and stone with a heart of flesh full of the love and salvation of God. Faith means to confess, but faith means to commit. Remember Psalm 37, verse 5, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. The analogy I always love to use in committee is when you put that stamped, addressed envelope into the letter box, the post box, the mailbox, you are committing it into the care of the Postal Service. And most of the time, you do not worry that that letter is going to arrive at its destination. You're pretty confident it is. You're certainly not going to lose any sleep over it. That's how we should be with God. When we commit our burdens, our prayer requests, our struggles, our successes, our whole being, our life, our family, our faith, our future to God, we should also have the rest of faith, knowing that he is able to keep that which we commit unto him against that day. And then faith means believe, receive, confess, commit, think of the old hymn, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. So trust is a very, very important thing. Oftentimes in the Old Testament, trust is used shall we say, even more than faith. We seem to hear faith more in the New Testament, <laughs> trust in the Old, but they're, they're related, they're important. And trust means we really do look to God and believe He will come through for us, and we rest in that fact. One of the most wonderful verses in the whole Bible, in fact, two verses, is found in the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. It's one of those promises that many Christians have memorized and quote often because it is that wonderful. And it has to do with trusting God. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Not just some of the heart, all of the heart. And not just with your head, but with your heart. Jesus has to be here to do the most good. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. Yes, we are given a reasoning mind by God, but reason should not override faith. There are things we don't understand, there are things we can't comprehend, but that is to be no impediment to putting all our trust in God all of the time. And therefore, we do not lean on our understanding, but it doesn't mean we turn it off. It means we reason and we figure out as best we can and leave the rest to God. But don't let that reasoning mind in any way try to shipwreck your faith and trust in the Lord. Never allow that. It says in all your ways, verse 6, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. What a powerful promise. You have the guarantee of divine direction as you put all your trust in the Lord all of the time. And then we have the final thing. Trust and obey. Peter said in Acts 5 verse 29, We ought to obey God rather than men. Friends, we do believe in obeying the authorities. Romans chapter 13, we are under the authorities that have been installed by God. They, the authorities may not know God, they may not be serving God 
in a conscious way. They may even resist the doctrine of God and be anti-biblical or anti-Christian. At the same time, we trust God and we obey authorities. But there may come times, and we live in times like this, where the authorities will ask us to do something that is a direct and clear violation of faith. Peter said we ought to obey God rather than man. May you have the maturity, and may you have the wisdom, and may you have the discernment to know when to obey man as authority and when to obey God. Well, we obey God all times, but there may come times when we have a clash of obedience, and God must always come first. Remember there, the steps to faith, believe, receive, commit, confess, actually it's confess, commit, trust, and obey. Please know the difference between faith and hope. Faith is for the now. Hope is for the future. It's a quiet confidence, that is hope, in future good. Hope is an anchor to the soul. Faith is to be activated and used at all times. I hope you got the difference. Faith is now. Hope is now looking to the future. And then, of course, remember faith. Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. What a great description. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. This is a description. It's not actually a definition in the classic sense of the word, but it tells it well. And here's another classic verse, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. No, faith is not blind, as some people think or misinterpret the verse. Faith is not blind. Faith does see. Faith sees very well. And biblical faith is more than 2020 vision because it sees him who is invisible. It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By the new birth, we see the kingdom of God, which, as we learn, the world cannot see. Now in Habakkuk, or for the Americans, Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 4, the verse that spawned the Protestant Reformation, a verse that is repeated not once, not twice, but three times in the New Testament. Habakkuk 2.4, repeated in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38, the just shall live by his faith. It's that simple. Ultimately, that faith has to be rightly directed. After all, some people may have faith that the chair they sit on is going to hold up their weight, faith that when they put the key in the ignition, the car will turn on and start operating. But no, we need faith in something very priceless and powerful. And that, my friends, is called the gospel. What we heard in Mark 1.15, believe the gospel. Which, of course, raises the question, what is the gospel? Well, the Greek word evangelion tells us it is the good news. The good news of what? Well, the good news of Christ. The coming of Christ, the atoning work of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, the ascension and return of Christ. The gospel is wonderfully summarized in just two verses of 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4. This is the gospel in capsule form. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel. It's it. Christ came, he died according to the scriptures, he was buried. He rose again, according to the scriptures. Believe this fact, receive him, and a great miracle will occur. Let me summarize. Why was Christ put to death? He was delivered unto death 
for our transgressions, offenses, and sins. He was buried, not cremated. He was buried, according to the scriptures. He rose again from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. Those who believe this gospel and the truth that it represents are declared righteous before God. It is credited to them for righteousness' sake. We'll look at this in just a moment. But I love what it says in Titus 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done. We are not saved because we've earned our way into the pearly gates. But according to his mercy, he saved us. Not what we have done, it's what he has done. It is finished. According to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's all God. It's a free gift. It is good news. Believe, receive, confess, commit, trust, and obey, and it is yours. Let me quickly, with the time that we have left, speak of the benefits of the foundation of faith, faith in Christ, faith in the gospel, faith in the cross, but whereby we have the great exchange. The gospel grants us that which the blood of bulls and goats could not, and that is the forgiveness of sins. Our sins are forgiven, they're remitted, they're taken away, they're even forgotten. So if God forgets, don't remind him. We have forgiveness of sins, and I might add, thanks to the cross, deliverance from the sin nature. The thing in us that causes us to sin is taken away. It's kind of like having a virus on your computer, hard drive, and you don't know how to get rid of it, so you know what do you do? You wipe the hard drive clean and reinstall your software. Well, that's what the cross of Christ is. And by the way, the virus is gone because of the cleansing of the wiping out. That's what God does through the cross. He wipes out the old age. We don't have to patch the holes in our life with a new patch on an old garment. No, we just become a new garment, a new work in him. So we get forgiveness of sins and deliverance from the sin nature. We get the gift of eternal life. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then there's this wonderful thing called imputation. I know we don't use this word in daily speech. Imputation. That which belongs to somebody is granted to another. See, in Jesus, he is righteous. In fact, he's called in the epistle of 1 John, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And understand, righteousness is a wonderful thing. Self-righteousness is not, but God's righteousness is. Righteousness is right standing before God and right actions on behalf of God. Jesus covers all those bases. We don't. Isaiah says our righteousness as his filthy rags, and that's saying it politely. I won't elaborate what he really means. Our righteousness is no good. His is totally good. The gospel imputes Christ's righteousness to us. That's the miracle that happens. We are going to see this in operation. In fact, Philippians 3, 9 says, Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. We not only have righteousness, we now become righteous, not because we earned it, but because it's part of the free gift of the gospel. Believe and receive. We also are sanctified, which means we are set apart for God's holy purpose. Even when Saul of Tarsus was a bully, giving to heaps of trouble to the ancient church, he had been set apart by God for apostolic ministry, and boy, did he do a phenomenal job. Not because of his own righteousness, but he partnered with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He died to his old self on the cross. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was at the right man at the right time doing the right work. So righteousness is imputed, sanctification is imputed, and justification, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. 
And such were some of you, but you are washed, and you are sanctified, and you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What is justification? Now, some people say, just as if I never sinned. Well, yes, that's it, but it's more. Justification means you are declared not guilty and you are declared righteous before God because of faith that imputes the good things of Christ. Friends, the steps to salvation are so simple. Romans 10 verses 9 to 10. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Foundational doctrine of the Christian faith is faith. It's time to pray, and if you don't know Jesus, or you're far from him, join me. Father, thank you for the gift of faith. We exercise it. We believe, receive, confess, commit, trust, and obey. We thank you for forgiveness of sins, deliverance from the sin nature, the gift of eternal life, imputation of sanctification, righteousness, and justification. Help us to receive these things and to run with them and to live our lives for you and to see your kingdom extended and your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Christ's glorious name, amen. Well, thank you for joining with me. We're going to continue the journey of the foundational doctrines of the faith, building blocks so that you have a sure foundation from all of life's storms.